So Father David, I'm speaking to you in Jerusalem. Um, what is the impact where you are of the coronavirus in terms of religion and belief, of course, but also in the Holy Land? So I think that the coronavirus has pushed us to think very, very carefully and deeply about what is our role as religious leaders. We are in a very big crisis, as you know, all over the world, because our church life is so much dependent on the physical presence of the faithful in church to participate in the sacramental life of the church. And this has got me personally thinking, and I think many, many of my colleagues thinking as well, what is our role in such a situation? It's almost apocalyptic. And I find myself coming back to think really essentially, what are we supposed to do? So I think first and foremost in the experience that I'm having dealing with believers faithful from my community, the first is a very strong role of being a consoler, consolation, not, not some kind of fake, it's all going to be okay, but rather consolation that comes out of allowing people to express their grief, their anxiety, their anguish, which is related to the fear of death. It's related to the fear of the illness itself, but also, of course, in many, many cases, it's related to being alone the sense of complete isolation. And here I'm speaking, of course, particularly about the elderly. And even if there are two or three uh, uh, in one place, that does not necessarily mean that that sense of isolation and loneliness is any less. So really, this is coming through very, very strongly. And the sense of responsibility that when people call very often before the crisis, I'd say, okay, they'll call back tomorrow. I, I don't have time today. But the realization now that it's important to answer the phone, to talk, to allow people to really express this part of, of, the, uh, this part of their lives, which is a sense of grief, of loss, and of deep anguish. I think that there is the second role that's very important, and again, to try and encourage, uh, to try and encourage, and I notice I myself am not a parish priest, but I find that the most impressive parish priests are those who are trying to find every way to reach out, not to wait for the faithful to call, but to put themselves on the screen. I'm doing a lot of teaching, also religious teaching, catechism for children on the screen. I feel incredibly uncomfortable with it. I'm realizing that I'm really a person who needs the physical presence, but I'm forcing myself to go through it because again, this is the role of trying to be a source of encouragement, trying to ensure that communication is flowing despite everything. We have a parish priest in Bersheva, a really dynamic uh, younger Polish priest, and I notice that he has every day numerous activities on the social media. And I think that this is wonderful as a source of encouragement and making sure that in place of real sacramental communion, the kind of community communion is ongoing and communication is flowing. And it's really wonderful to see that. And do you think this is something that will continue when things return to some kind of normality? Ed, I will tell you one of my nightmares, and that is that not only might this continue, but that people will get used to it and start to prefer this kind of communication to really gathering together and coming together. I really hope not. I teach a class, uh, you know, kind of religious subject. We study the Gospel of Luke together, and uh, the people who participate every Friday morning in our house cajoled me into starting the class on Zoom. And I begin each time with saying, please do not get used to this. Please, we want to come together physically. But I think that it's opening up avenues of communication, types of communication that might be pastorally useful. Uh, people who don't come to church, but now can tune in, can get a chance to express themselves, can receive some kind of uh, nourishment 
from religious leaders over the social media. This is something that I've heard a number of times from ministers during this series, um, where they've reached communities who wouldn't have crossed the threshold of their church or mosque or synagogue. Yes. So there's yes. this remarkable connection. I mean, it's somewhat ironic that we have to be in social isolation to, uh, to, to build this connection, but there's a real connection there, David. It's not just a technological um, conversation. There seems to be a genuine connection. What do you put that down to? So I think that there are many different types of people and some people really feel more comfortable speaking with the priest uh, through this kind of media. Um, I think that something new is definitely happening. I think it's too early to say exactly what it is. But the fact that we can reach in another way, uh, not just wait for people to come to church, but also have people call in or have us call people is part of a third thing that we really need to think about, and that is how to build up community. It's one of the things that the church really has to deal with, and I'm thinking of two particular themes. One is, in the old days, the parish church was in the middle of a little village, and everybody could toddle over to church. It, you know, distances were no problem. We now live in this incredibly wide, spread out kind of parish. And I think that people simply don't find the time, the energy, the opportunity to come physically. So this opens something up. But there's something else that I've been thinking about. And even I've just published an article in the this week's tablet. Um, something that I experienced of a Passover. I every year attend a Passover Seder. And I love it. It's a place of, for me to learn about liturgy. And this year, for the first time, uh, I participated in a Zoom Seder. And I realized that we have something to learn from Jews that have a parallel home liturgy to the synagogue liturgy. And although it's true that Catholics pray at home, we don't have that liturgical moment that has a very great significance in our lives as Catholics in the family unit, mother, father, children who come together and really worship in a liturgical form. And I think that this is something that we as church really need to think about. We are too clerical. We are too institutionally oriented, meaning people must come to the parish. And I think that when we come out of this, we need to really think once again about something that's there right in the beginning in the Acts of the Apostles. They went to the temple and then they came home and broke bread at home. And that wasn't just eating. It was a liturgical commemoration of the center of our faith. And I think that this is something very important that we need to learn from this crisis. So it's almost a sort of sacrament of home, isn't it? This sort of um, a theology of home. But yes, yes, yes. From other Christians, that the sense of uh, the sanctity of a building, the church, uh, and what takes place there um, is not so easily transferred into a house, into someone's home. I think we need to start working on this. This was the genius of Chazal. Ah, this was the genius of the sages of Israel, that they created two axes. So there's the axis of the synagogue and the rabbi and whatever goes on in the synagogue. And then there is a parallel axis with just as much importance, and that's the home. And we lack that other axis. In other words, it's not saying give up the sacraments, give up the church. Absolutely not. That's absolutely central. But I think that we need to really realize that because we live in such a spread out world, and the parish is no longer at the center of the community, but we have to make an effort to go to the parish. We need to more and more sacralize and sanctify what goes on at home in the family. And this is a great thing that we can learn from our Jewish brothers and sisters. And to learn from the crisis itself. Um, and as we're drawing this uh, podcast to a close, uh, I, I can't end without asking you about the impact um, on the ground there, particularly for those communities who have it much harder, um, yes. the migrant communities, the asylum seekers, many Palestinians. Um, and I wonder if we can just touch on not so much the practical question, um, uh, but how theologically, how you minister to those people, because 
I know you, David, you'd be straight out on the streets um, trying to um, help people. You can't do that now. So what can you do? Well, I do go out on the streets because we've had calls of people about to be evicted from their apartments. So there's something very practical, practical here in terms of thinking what obliges me, despite everything, to go out and help. Um, once again, I think that it is very, very important for these people to know that we are with them. This is the whole theme of solidarity that many, many have been talking about, that we've all exposed. Again, this cannot be some kind of nice thought, because it's not a nice reality. The people who are poor are much more exposed than the rich. They can't isolate themselves very often. They do not even have the type of sanitary uh, stuff that they need in order to take care. So again, for me, it's very important to find ways through social media, through telephone calls, through whatever way is possible to say we are, we are here and we are with you. That is a very weak thing to do when people are locked up in a tiny place, extremely anxious about ev being evicted from their rented apartments and sometimes worrying about food. Uh, where, where is the next meal going to come from? And so again, uh, reaching out to the people around me, the people that I know and those that have names, it's really the attempt to say, I'm here, call me, I'm available. Father David Neuhaus, thank you very much. Thank you, Ed.